Hello and welcome to episode 53 of Stitched in Sweden. I'm Maria and you can find me on Ravelry as M. Manska and on Instagram as Stitched in Sweden. Today I have a bit of everything to talk to you about. I have been uh, back for the first few weeks of the new semester at school, so there hasn't been as much making going on day to day, but I definitely still have been making a lot of things. But in a way, my uh, time is more limited, and even though I still do manage to get a lot of making in, I sort of see myself shifting towards different kinds of projects, which can be either completed in shorter times or are easier to pick up and put down. Um, I don't know if that's really true, actually. Maybe I'm just trying to find an excuse for why I'm not working on my Rock Island shawl. But anyway, so I will start out today with this week in Stockholm and the past few weeks. So like I said, I have started the new semester at school and that's going all right so far. I have been pleasantly surprised that summer seems to be holding on and we are having a very nice uh, fall. With that, I have been spending a lot of time outside on the weekends. This past weekend we went to a farmer's market, which I didn't know existed before. Um, but we got a lot of nice fresh produce there and um, some things that I made into jam. So I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, I've also been making some bread this week. I tried out some of the tips for that you sent me, that some, some viewers sent me, uh, with the sourdough, and also I've been trying a yeasted bread. Um, I don't know if you call it yeasted bread, but bread with quick, or just like dry active yeast instead of sourdough, that I have been making during the weeks when I don't necessarily have the time to devote to making a loaf of sourdough, and that's been coming out really nicely as well. So I'm realizing now as I'm recording that I, in the past couple of weeks, I've had all of these moments when I've thought, oh, I should talk about that on the podcast. And then for some reason, I don't write it down. And now I'm thinking, what were all those things that I was planning to talk about? So if you have a question, let me know. From this week on, I'll try and be a little bit more diligent about writing down things when I think about them. In terms of what I worked on this week, I am not sure how much I got done on my Rock Island shawl. I'm pretty sure it's in the same place where I left it, which is about here. I haven't worked on it for a few days, and that is mostly because the needles were stolen off of it for another project. Um, but I, I think also part of it, a part of the reason I haven't been working on that so much is because I haven't needed a shawl uh, to wear to school yet because the weather has been so nice. So um, I know that will be a shawl that I wear a lot during the winter because it's really warm with the Brooklyn Tweed Loft. And... Yeah, since I already had that shawl before, before I lost it, uh, I know that I wear it throughout the deep winter, I guess. So it'll just be going on in the background, I guess, but the main reason why I think I haven't been working on that so much is because I do have to look at the chart the whole time that I'm knitting it, and that hasn't been the type of knitting that I've been wanting to do lately. One project that I cast on, have cast on since the last time I podcasted is the Ramble Shawl, which is a new pattern by Andrea Maori. This is a asymmetrical shawl that's knit, I guess, knit on the bias. 
and I am currently knitting it in two colors of Quince & Co. in two different weights actually. One is Quince & Co. Chickadee and one is Quince & Co. Finch. But this pattern is a little bit... Um, I found it a little bit confusing for what um, amount of yarn that you needed because it says that you need two... I think it's like two skeins of each color and there's two colors in the shawl. But actually when you look at the recommended yarn, the size of the skeins, they're, they come in 50 gram skeins, so it's really like half, half a skein of a normal 100 gram skein. Um, so really it's like a two color shawl with two skeins of yarn. And it, it say, suggests that it's a DK weight, but I think that according to the um, the physical weight, like the grams of the yarn per yardage, to me it seems more of a sport weight. But I haven't ever felt or you know seen the actual yarn that was used to knit the pattern, the original pattern. So. It could be that it's a very plump yarn that plumps up to a DK, but anyway, I found that the yardage was very similar to uh, Quince & Co. Chickadee, which is a sport weight. So for 50 grams, Quince & Co. Chickadee has 166 meters, or 181 yards. So you would need four skeins of Quince & Co. Chickadee, I think. Two in each color, if you... yeah. But, I don't have four skeins of chickadee. I have two skeins. One um, in this, let's see, one is in frost, which is a light blue, very light blue um, color, which I used to knit um, the sample for my Rhea vest pattern. And the other color I have in chickadee, which again is a sport weight, is egret, which is just this cream creamy white. It's kind of sunny outside, so it's getting bleached out, but it's basically just ivory. And I knit this. I used this to knit my Cybella pullover, which I love and is probably one of my most worn knit sweaters that I have ever made. So I had actually a full ball of each of those left over. And so I decided that I could knit this shawl with, um, yeah, pretending that these two were the same color, which they almost, yeah, they're not, but okay. And then using um, Quince & Co. Finch, which is the fingering weight yarn that I have three balls of, 150 grams, uh, throughout the whole thing. So let me just show you the progress that I've made so far. Here is the shawl, and you can see that I am working on the striped part now. Uh, this pattern has this striped part. Actually, now I have reached the end of the striping, and it will move into a um, sort of herringbone brioche section now, which will be a two-color brioche, and I'll be doing it with the egret and this blue color, which is um, bird's egg from Quince & Co. So these will be my two colors for the edging. And I think it will, um, yeah, I think it will look good. We will see. If I really like this shawl, I am considering knitting it in um, Madeline Tosh Pashmina. I was looking at some of the colors in that yarn and it's quite a pricey yarn, I guess, so I really wanted to see if I could knit something, come up with something that would work in my stash, and maybe if I still want to knit another version after this one, I could pick up some of the pashmina. I really liked a couple of different color combinations, but one that I was looking at was sort of a light mint green with a berry, cranberry color. Those two paired. And, yeah, uh, there was a lot of colors that I was just, yeah, really liked. But I thought I would go with something from my stash. 
and I'm really happy with how this is coming out. I'm at the point where I need to look at the pattern to learn how to do the herringbone brioche part, and that just hasn't happened yet. Uh, I kind of get stuck at these points of transition with my knitting, and I think that in a way I should try to not set a project down when I'm at a transition point. So, for example, knitting a sock, maybe I stop at, at the end of the cuff or stop right before starting the heel or, you know, right before starting the toe. Um, and for a sweater, I stop maybe when I just have the sleeves left. And then you're at some transition point and it could stay at that point for a long time because it's not like you just pick it up directly and start again, even though, yeah, you can pretty much do that. But it's like even that small thing of having to look at the instructions um, just to figure out where you, what you need to do next can be sort of like a barrier. So that is the Ramble Shawl, and it is part of a collection of patterns that Andrea Mowry did with um, Knit Pearl PDX, which is a yarn shop in Portland that I have never been to, but I have received some beautiful yarn from there from friends, so. Okay, um, that is it for knitting works in progress. Um, in terms of sewing, I have a few works in progress at the moment. The main one is my quilt. And this is the project that I spent probably the most time on in the past few weeks. And I'm so happy with how it's turning out. Uh, yeah, but it has been a lot of time. And part of the reason, well, I find that quilting takes a lot of time because in addition to doing the actual sewing of the quilt part, like sewing fabric together, you are also have to do a ton of pressing. Now that I'm looking at this fabric, I, I notice how wrinkly it is, but <laughs> I'll just show you the back. All of these pieces have to be pressed. so. Each time that you, basically every time that you sew a line, it has to be pressed one way or the other. So here's an example of a block that I'm working with. I have about, how many of these do I have? Something like 83 or something of these. And each of these, you know, you can just imagine. I have lots of them. And I'm using the Rifle Paper Co. fabric in from Cotton and Steel, which came out in the um, kind of new collection. And I just love that the fabric. Um, I'm using that for the blocks here. And then I've used some... Um, I think it was called Modern Backgrounds from Moda for the um, white part here. And there's different kinds of backgrounds. There's this, I think this is called like Elemental or something, it has some chemistry stuff. And then there's some handwriting. And I think they just make a really nice background, kind of like a low volume background. And I have some different fabrics in. Um, the quilt as well in the mixed in with the rifle paper go so I don't think that I can really show this quilt but I'll just show you then once I have those strips I sew them together like this into a block and then these all together and when I have the quilt laid out on the floor it looks like it's about a queen or king size quilt um, that was not really my plan. I was going for kind of a large throw. <laughs> How do you go from a large throw to a king size quilt? Um, I wanted a quilt that could be for two people on a couch and 
I think this is going to be huge, but what I might do is, I, I still haven't sewn all the pieces together, obviously, um, but I might sew a couple of more together and just get the feeling for how big it's going to be once it's stitched together and uh, test it out on the couch before I put it together with the backing and the batting. So you can see my, I did a little drawing here. This is just kind of laying it out, uh, my plan for how it would be, and I have some math over here, how many squares I need and stuff like that. And this is a, it's called a Irish chain quilt. And I didn't use a particular pattern, but I think it's called the Missouri Quilt Company. It has a YouTube channel with a lot of tutorials for how to make different types of quilt blocks. And I followed the, generally I followed the instructions for the Irish chain quilt there, but a lot of the notes on the YouTube channel said that the, um, fabric requirements were way off, so that's just a tip in case you are also interested in making that quilt that you might want to check that. So that is, yeah, the main sewing thing that I've been working on this week, but actually since school, not this week, the past couple of weeks anyway, after school started I have sort of put that to the side because um, it does just take up a lot of space and time. Um, and I was waiting to get the batting in the mail, and that came yesterday, so now I I might spend some time this weekend um, sewing up the top, the quilt top, and um, yeah, seeing how huge it is in the end. Well, um, yeah, so I'm looking forward to that. Otherwise, I am working on another brow this week, of course. And I started this, I want to say last night, but I might have cut it, no, I think I cut the pieces out the night before. That's kind of how it's been lately. It's like maybe one night I cut out the pieces, the next night I sew a little bit of it. Yeah. Kind of, that's how it's going. Um, so this is going to be a Boylston, Boylston? I don't know how to say that, Boylston? bra, which is another pattern from Orange Lingerie, and this, I'm just going to show you the one I finished first so I don't have to explain it. So this is a finished object, but um, it will make it easier to s understand what this is going to look like in the end. So this is a pattern that um, I have made before, but I haven't made it with um, just fabric. I've made it as a foam bra before, but I wanted to try it out and try see the f how the fit was with fabric. So um, I really like it. It's I need a couple of adjustments from this one, and I'm making those on the apricot one, which I'll show you in a minute. But so here it is, Boylston. This is obviously a sheer black uh, mesh bra that is um, in kind of a balconette, bal I think that's how you say it, style. Uh, it does not have lace, which is, I think, the first bra that I have made without um, lace, but it still, I think, has a, yeah, a feminine touch with the pico edges and the sheer, the sheer fabric in it. Um, so how this is different from the Marlboro pattern, which is the pattern I've been using mostly, is that the um, lower cup is split with a seam pretty much right down the middle of it that lands at the apex, and then the top, uh, the upper cup is straight, more straight across, and it's one piece instead of two. Um, if you want to adjust a pattern like this to have a scalloped lace edge, you have to take away the top seam allowance, which I have done on the next one that I'll show you. This one fits really well. Uh, it 
is pretty much done to pattern except for I have to decrease the fabric out of the upper cup so if I go like this on a normal bra I have a lot of extra fabric here but the lower cup fits well so I did that on for this one I knew that I was gonna have to do that because I had to do that for I uh, like for every pattern um, so I kind of did a guess on how much I should take out and it ended up being slightly too much which all that does is pull this the bridge center away from my chest wall slightly but it's definitely still wearable still really comfortable the other thing about this one that I will adjust for the next is that the um, strap connection is really far out towards my arm and it rubs a little bit right here it's definitely still wearable um, I could go a whole day without really noticing it but then if I put it on a second day I kind of feel like oh, a little bit of irritation there um, so it's really easy fix I'll just move it in um, for the next one which yeah I have done so yay <laughs> um, yeah I'm still obsessed with bra making I made this one in the first week that I was back at in school and it was kind of fun because yeah like I said one night cut out the pieces next night sewed them together next night did the elastic and the channeling and then finished it off um, so it's it's really easy to stop and start kind of kind of project so that's that one back to the one I'm working on now uh, this is the same pattern. This is the lower cup. Oh yeah, really quick. This one ha is a double layer of this um, mesh and it's fully lined so the seams are all enclosed so you don't have any rough edges on the inside. There's the inside for you. Um, this one is also fully enclosed. I will always do patterns like that. Now I will never have exposed seams, so it's, it's a given. Um, but this one is lined with a beige um, bra tool, which is like slightly stretchy, but it's not elastic stretch. It's like mechanical give, I guess that is a thing. I still don't know very much about fabric terms. But this is kind of a um, apricot peach-ish. It's not the best lighting right now. But it's sort of an apricot peach colored lace. And I'll try to get the, that behind it so maybe. Is that better? And it has a lilac kind of border on it. And this will um, also be a Boylston, so it has more of the straight across the top rather than the Marlboro one, which is more like this. And for this one, I have adjusted the position of the strap, so hopefully it will be in a little bit more and that will be more comfortable. And I also lengthened the upper cups just slightly so that yeah, I just made that adjustment. Anyway, I have all the pieces here. Some of them are sewed together, but this is it. <laughs> um, I wanted to work on that last night, but Thomas needed the desk, so that means I do knitting instead, so that's fine. Okay, other projects that I finished since the last time I spoke, I think, you have seen these on Instagram if you follow me there but I don't think I show them on the podcast this is a Marlboro bra and it is screaming red it's definitely outside of my comfort zone but I thought this lace was interesting because um, the lace is sort of lined itself you can see there's the lacy part of the lace from from the inside you can see the lacy part of the lace and then this part is kind of yeah trans not transparent it's opaque because the lace is yeah kind of lined so basically for this one I didn't 
put an additional lining for the upper cup and only lined the lower cup and the power bar, which is this side part. So you can see maybe that this cup is a little bit different than the black one that I was showing you before, just where the seams are. And yeah, this fits great. Um, I have put the lace detail on the bottom. And actually another different thing about this one is that I didn't use mesh for the back band. I just used the lace itself because the lace is stretchy. And because it was kind of lined already, um, I felt like it was pretty substantial and could just be used as a back on its own. And that works really well for this particular lace. So there is that. I really like that pattern. Um, I make them all the time, apparently. Here is another one that I made. This is Marlboro. Um, and it's in a nice bright blue. Um, and I lined it with an ivory power knit. This is the first time I've used um, this power knit, which is a stretch fabric, to line the entire thing except for the bridge, which I always use a non-stretch fabric for. I like how this one turned out. It has a little bit more of a casual feel to it. I think if I, if I use Power Knit again, I would still use a firm fabric for the um, frame part, which is this piece here. Um, just because, I don't know, I think that would make it fit better. But I really like this one, and when I'm wearing it, it looks pretty much skin color for me. And I think it's a cool effect. Last time I talked to you, I was working on a mint lace um, Marlboro bra, which I'm actually wearing right now, so that is not available to show. Um, but. I think that's probably the, my most most worn and favorite bra that I have made, and I made it using this fabric, which does not look mint green, but it, it really is. And I bought this from Mint Frog on Etsy, and I got a little bit extra so that I can make a matching pair of underwear when I try that for the first time, which I haven't done yet. Maybe soon. Um, but I will insert a picture for it here that I posted on Instagram so you can see how that turned out. I got a little bit more lace fabric. Here is one which I did not like at first. Like when I first looked at it I thought it was pretty weird. But I think it's going to be really pretty. And I'll line this probably with an ivory color. And here is the lace of the apricot one that I'm working on right now. That's kind of what it looks like when it comes just in a big stretchy strip like this. So that is what I have been making and finishing for the past couple weeks. In addition, I have been um, making a lot of food. I make dinner every night pretty much, and I have been trying out um, some new recipes from The Modern Preserver, which is a book that I've sh I shared a, a couple episodes back, and I've been having a lot of fun with that. So one thing that I made this week is some apple sage ginger butter. I think it's just called apple sage butter in the book, but it also has ginger in it. And this turned out really good. Um, I've been enjoying it on some sourdough bread, and um, I think today I'll have some with a little sourdough bread, a little layer of that, and then some goat cheese on top I think could be really delicious. Um, I got these jars from Ikea. I was really skeptical that they would seal, but they do. Um, so thank you for all your suggestions of where to buy jars. I'm just still a little bit shocked that it is 
such a such an American thing, I guess. I didn't realize that the screw top jars were American. The, just like mason jars. Or ball jars. Um, so I made this over the weekend, and I also made some applesauce from some apples that Thomas's parents' neighbor had given them, and they had too many of them, so they gave us some. And I made an applesauce uh, with some pears in it as well that I just got from the grocery store. And that turned out so delicious, and it was so easy to make. I can definitely recommend making your own applesauce. It was so good. And it had very little sugar in it. I think the pears really added to the sweetness of it. Um, so I keep that one in the refrigerator because I don't know about like the sugar level in terms of if it can be outside of the refrigerator. Um, but it is already opened and being eaten now, so I hope to make a bigger batch um, if I can get some more apples, which I just need to go talk to my neighbor because their yard is overflowing with apples at the moment. Yesterday I made some lingonberry jam, which is a Swedish thing, I guess, or Scandinavian maybe. I'm not saying that it's one of those things because I'm sure that I'm wrong, but I know that um, it's difficult or impossible to get lingonberries in the US, I don't know. Um, but I have heard that you can get lingonberry jam at Ikea, so there you go. I made three jars of this. Oh yeah, I have more jars of this too, but I just brought one to show. I made three jars of this um, lingonberry jam. Lingonberries are about the size of a green pea and they are kind of like, taste most similar, I would say, to a cranberry. If you don't know what a lingonberry tastes like, but you know what a cranberry tastes like, there you go. Oftentimes this is used um, with like mashed potatoes and meatballs or um, yeah, other kinds of meats and things like that, which I'm a vegetarian and I mostly made this for Thomas. But I think that it would also be really good with cheese, again. <laughs> um, but it could be really good in a sandwich. So it's pretty tart. I don't know that you would just spread it on bread alone. Um, it's not like a blueberry jam, like the blueberry jam I made before, which is much sweeter and more suitable to be eaten alone, I guess. But I'm pretty satisfied with this, and we'll just have to give it a try soon. I think that is about it in terms of what I have been making and doing this week, uh, in the past couple of weeks as well. I think my plan for the weekend will be to make some progress on my ramble shawl, um, just to get past that weird transition point, and definitely work a bit more on the apricot colored bra that I'm that I started and hopefully I can get my uh, quilt top sewn up it's a lot of things that I want to do and I have a big paper no, it's not that big eight pages that I need to write for Tuesday so I'm hoping that I can get most of it finished early in the week so that I can have the weekend free to do whatever I want. Alright, so I will talk to you again soon, and until then, happy making! Bye!